Okay, then 4.31 a.m., I get a, a phrase from, uh, you know, I start hearing the nanny theme song. She's the lady in red when everybody else is wearing tan, specifically that phrase. I felt that this was related to this idea of people sort of supposedly caretaking us in like nannies. But they're basically, they're not really nannies, they're more like... jailers so then I have this dream about I want to negotiate getting paid and this is the this is the one that <clears throat> I had that made me think that I should focus on these dreams so I want to negotiate getting paid I'm sitting around a table with Michael Scott Pam and maybe others so obviously characters from the office um, I've just been hired officially and I want to get paid for all the years I've been used and made to work without pay. It seems like I go through this twice. So I'm trying to get, basically get to the table and negotiate the situation. It happens twice in the dream. The second time, which I remember better, we're sitting around a table and Michael Scott is on the phone with Toby Flenderson, who in the office is director of human resources. Asking about, let's see, he's on the phone with Toby Flenderson asking about this. When Toby asks him who is asking, he doesn't want to say. The idea is I've just been hired and no one knows me yet. But that, I'm saying this has to be fake. How do they not know me? Also, what does it matter? I've been working for them for years. So in other words, why does whether or not you know me have anything to do with whether you're paying me for my labor? And that's in this case, it's not labor exactly. It's something else. But in the dream, it's more like labor. The first time this happens is harder to remember. I'm face to face with Toby and Pam. So the second time we're on a phone, Toby's on the phone and Michael and I are sitting around a table. The second time we're all face to face. But something else happens. It seems like it involves catching a bus and colored jello. <laughs> Different colors of jello, rainbow colors. Um, and Pam is more involved. I wonder if this is linked to the idea of jello shots. And I keep thinking of this. Um, um, I don't know. I feel like my my mind's being blanked right now, so I'm not remembering what I want to remember, so I'm not going to talk about it right now. It's not that important. Okay, so, and pa Pam is more involved in this. Pam and I are linked somehow. So it's almost like, yeah, we're linked somehow. I'm still a new hire, but the issue is the same. Both times the process is derailed by Michael Scott. And both times it seems like they don't want to discuss the issue of back pay because I'm a new hire. Michael Scott is the gatekeeper to Toby Flenderson. I don't know who Michael Scott rep I mean, you know, I can guess that, you know, it's Michael, guys named Michael, of which there have been a couple in my life and a couple involved in this. And Scott being linked, I think, to Freemasonry, for Scottish Rite. Um, Toby, the, you know, there's a Toby that I've mentioned in Olympia that's been part of this. I don't know if Toby Flenderson is related to that person or not. Toby Flenderson in the office is a uh, human resources person. But, um, and Pam... I think, I, you know, I don't know if Pam represents, a lot of things. times on The Office, well, on, on TV shows, one person represents frequently multiple people in similar roles. Pam's demeanor um, in general in The Office reminds me a little of Melinda. But she might also be linked to me in some ways, so, which Melinda is as well. Anyway, the idea is 
I thought, okay, this kind of thing that was going on, it certainly couldn't be happening without there being a plan in place to deal with the end game, but whatever, there wasn't. Because people seem to believe that early on, or at least they tried to communicate with me, this idea that we would be compensated by the entertainment industry somehow. That they would, you know, and maybe maybe if this had all changed around when we were 20 years old or something, that might have made sense. Um, if we were trying to be entertainers and everything came out in our early 20s when we still had, you know, our whole lives and careers ahead of us, then maybe that would have made sense. But it doesn't make sense now, especially with the way the entertainment industry has treated us. They don't seem to be too anxious to help us out at this point. Um, and they never try. they never were. I mean, this whole thing was set up not to resolve at a young age. If, if, if it was going to resolve, they wouldn't have taken away my guitars. They wouldn't have my, you know, made my mom, you know, hold my guitars hostage and brainwash me to think that I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that. And, you know, they wouldn't have done all of that stuff. They, would have, they wouldn't have sabotaged us in the ways that they sabotaged us if they had any intention of ever making good on this. So we can't, like, rely on the good nature of that industry. Um, I would still like to, you know, I don't want to alienate the whole industry, but it's not like anything that we've done that's caused the alienation. It's this whole situation that's caused it. So that's not going to work. But that doesn't mean that we still don't want to have our art respect. You know, I mean, that's all we ever wanted to do was be artists, Chris and I, really. And that's what we worked for. And that's, you know, it was important that we did that because I don't know if we would have figured this out. Otherwise, it would have been harder because it's more obvious when you can, you know, that just the blacklisting from that level is really obvious. Um, but, you know, like I said to Chris, you know, Chris was a huge influence. If, you know, Kurt Cobain had said Chris's name once, it would have been huge. But it, that's a long, you know, and he would have if he had been permitted to. So this was a, you know, his rights were also destroyed, but, you know, in a different way. So that's just one little piece of the destruction of Chris's career. And I'm not going to get into all those little pieces right now. But, you know, so I, what this made me do was think about, okay, well, what what about negotiating? So we have to negotiate this at this point? Well, what about this? What would make this make sense, this kind of negotiation? Let's say we did get to the table to talk to Michael, Michael Scott or whoever we're supposed to talk to, Toby Flenderson. Um, here's the deal. Number one, it isn't really fair for us to have to have this negotiation, this type of negotiation without legal advice. That's straight out crazy. That's why the very first thing I tried to do was seek legal advice. And that's what I was kidnapped for. It wasn't for being crazy. It wasn't for being suicidal. It wasn't for being dangerous. It was for trying to find an attorney before they had time to, you know, derail that process. Once they had me locked up and, you know, um, they had all this other stuff going on. They, you know, they turned the community against me and all this other... I mean, they were already turned against me, but they that, that whole thing was already in place. But they needed apparently some time to make sure that no attorneys would ever help me. So um, that's the whole reason why I was kidnapped and locked up in 2014. It has nothing to do with my mental health. It had everything to do with preventing me from talking to an attorney before they could get to them first. Um, and to this day, I maintain we need an attorney. Because there's too much going on. There's a too much to still to learn about what's happened. You can't you can't negotiate for something when you don't, you can't negotiate compensation for something when you don't even have the boundaries of what actually happened, what the potential to damage you still to all this other stuff. So yeah, but anyway, so that's one thing. That's number one. Number two, you know, moving along without that, just just brainstorming the situation. Who are we negotiating with exactly? Who would be responsible for enforcing any agreement that gets made? Uh, number three, our situation involves, it appears, millions of people. And this is a conservative estimate. It could be tens of millions. It could be hundreds of millions. It could be billions of people involved in this. 
And I think it might be billions of people because I think this is a worldwide situation. And I don't know how that's possible, but I think that might be the truth. So if that's true, how does finance work with all these people? I mean, certainly it, this isn't an unprecedented situation. There are movies that get go out to billions of people, like Star Wars, you know, that people get paid for. So there's ways, there's, there's some type of model to work from on that. I'm just not sure what it is because I'm not exactly sure what went out and how much of it went out and who accessed, you know. So that's a discovery thing that needs to happen. We need to be paid for the destruction of our careers. This is really important. We should be paid back salary for this compatible with what others earned in successful careers of the same type going back to age 18. This is not very hard to do because I... Um, you know, I had a communities that I was around and I know, you know, you could go back and see who someone in the same type of fields that I was trying to go into would have earned over this same period of time. Like the people that, what really comes to mind with me are these people that I worked with at this company called Evolt or, you know, this nonprofit group called Evolt. I mean, this was after my daughter was born, but, um, you know, before that I was trying to be a writer. I was, you know, um, sub submitting writing samples to different publications and things like that and getting rejected. Um, I was um, sabotaged out of a teaching career. Um, so, yeah, there's ways to look at that. Um, Chris should be paid as if he succeeded musically starting in the late 1970s. So he was clearly being sabotaged musically beginning in 1974. That's when the first real signs of sabotage of his career show up, 74. So 74, 84, 94, 2004, 2014, 2000. So we're talking about 46 years of musical success that he's been sabotaged out of. And, you know, it's not, I'm not to say that, you know, he necessarily automatically would have succeeded in 74, but the thing is he'd been exploited by the same industry all, for all these years prior to 74. So I think we should figure out that he did, should have succeeded. Because there's other things that they were doing to him to make sure, ensure that he didn't succeed. And so this whole grunge thing and everything that piggybacked off of, you know, his exploitation, um, he should be, you know, honestly, he should be paid like Madonna. That's how I feel. You know, or perhaps Jay-Z, who is a billionaire. However, money is not what mattered to Chris. That's the thing. His music, the restoration, should be part of this. Um, damages. And does anyone have a good recording of his performances, his masters? Because his performances were dam were sabotaged as well as his, re his recordings. And you can never go back and repair that unless... Um, you can't. You can't really go back and repair that. His performances were sabotaged with directed energy weapons, with psychological manipulations, with bad sound. His recordings were sabotaged in the same way. Especially, you know, maybe if he could go back to masters of his recordings and everything, you could come up with um, a better mix of some of this stuff that was sabotaged in the mixing and the mastering process. Um, his publicity rights are a big factor. That was all, those were all stolen fraudulently. You know, that should not be a big hub, hubbub to, to, to restore those. That should be the first thing that happens. Um, and Chris also needs to also ensure that his legacy is passed into the hands of who he says he wants his, hand, his legacy to be passed into, which is me, because I would curate it and caretake it, and, and I don't know anybody else that would care about it the way I do. You know, and then the types of songs and everything that he did, I understand that he was encouraged to do a lot of stuff, you know, but, you know, it is what it is, but he was encouraged, he was not given the same tools to work with as other artists were given by a long shot, and he was encouraged to write a bunch of songs about drugs and stuff like that, that's just the way it is, but it doesn't mean that his music isn't valuable, because it is. His music is good, he would have had number one hits if he had been properly um, presented and guided. And he still has songs that are that quality. So there's songs that he wrote. I'm in the hallway now, so the sound quality is going to be a little bit. There's songs that he wrote, like, um, you know, Summertime Again or More TV or whatever that, you know, I think, you know, there's others too, but could have been 
huge hits. And then others that just needed a little more maybe um, production, you know, somebody who knows production, stuff like um, Crashing Hard or things like that that are really, there's songs of his that are really good. But, you know, nowadays it's a different style of music that's popular too. So there's a lot of stuff that you just can't go back and restore. But at the same time, he sh still should have access to the best type of restoration of his legacy that he can get. And stop with this, you know, destruction. And that's really important. Then I say we should pay damages for pain and suffering. This part, we should also get some disclosure about the radio frequency activated devices in our bodies, the attacks we've already suffered, and the potential for later consequences. Like, for example, my face being burned for months on end. Not just my face, my hands and other parts of my body have been, you know, hit with these. I mean, I'm just talking about my skin at this point. But, you know, your face is burned for months on end with microwave weapons. Does that mean that you're, you know, dealing with um, increased risk for skin cancer? What other parts of my bodies have been hit with these weapons? I don't know. I don't think I can ever get full disclosure on that, but I should get some disclosure about my risks. Um, the attacks to my head, to my brain, all that kind of stuff. The things that were done to Chris physically, too. Um, this dental work and everything. Um, I think Chris was... I haven't even really begun to get into Chris's because I don't want to violate his privacy, but I know that his body was badly manipulated by these. And I think his weight and all of that was 100%. I mean, not 100%, but largely. The thing about this is I can go back because this is described in media going back years and years. I can go back and see that they planned to make him fat before he was even born. It was partly by introducing, you know, people who were genetically heavy into the family because the family was manipulated as if they were farm animals. We should be able to receive proper medical care as well, not have to fear assassination by doctor or by directed energy attacks. There's other pain and suffering too. Our family